Welcome, everybody, to another uh, episode live from Jerusalem with Rabbi Chaim Goldberg. Rabbi Goldberg's been sharing with us details about the book of Genesis. We've gone through a whole bunch and a whole different, uh, all the way to the front to back, a lot in the early beginning, and he just keeps coming up with more and more and more, and he's sharing with us the, the, the greatness of, of the Hebrew tradition in the details of Genesis. So we're joined uh, by a wonderful group in the Zoom room. We got people from uh, Germany and the UK. We got people from Arizona, from Atlanta, Georgia, people from uh, uh, Tennessee and all over the globe. It's always a joy to spend time with many people. So I'm not going to uh, delay anymore. I'm going to turn it over. Rabbi Goldberg, you're live on the air. Go from there. Good evening. Good evening for everybody. <laughs> Um, long time no speak, Dan. <laughs> Tony, I'm sorry for the last uh, for the meeting of last week. Uh, I lost it with a, a meeting that kept going on and on and on. So hopefully this week we're going to sit down. So I'm uh, apologizing. Um, good evening, everybody. We are continuing from last week. I gave you some homework. <laughs> I don't believe that I did. I gave you homework, all of you, uh, to think about uh, this uh, Ten Commandments in all sorts of ways. Um, <clears throat> some send me emails that they're thinking about those uh, or notes that they're thinking about those things um, but this is because I was for a long time high school principal so it's for me you know from time to time I need to give on work also um, <clears throat> basically let's go let's straight dive inside but uh, I will ask that if uh, someone wants to say some sort of uh, insight that he had what we said I said that uh, we have mainly three main relationships um, in each one and one of us. We have relationship with ourselves, we have relationship with God, and relationship with our friends, our neighbors, our friends. And I ask in the Ten Commandments if you can decide to say what is going to each part, what is uh, related to the relations between when man and himself, man and his fellowship, and man with God. Um, someone wants to say anything? I oh, can put the Ten Commandments on the screen. Someone have any ideas? Anything that he wants to say? Don't be shy, folks. Yeah, people are very afraid. I'm not going to eat anyone. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, I will start. It's okay. It's okay. I can start. I can speak. Now, the thing is not only to speak about the Ten Commandments. The reason why we spoke about the Ten Commandments, I'm reminding us all. First of all, um, we said that this is hinting, it's being hinted that this is the beginning of the Bible because it starts with the letter A, okay, with the beginning of the alphabetic, the Hebrew alphabetic. While in the beginning of the Bible, in the beginning of Genesis, we're starting in the letter uh, B, in the second letter. So we understand that there is a hint here that this is the basic, this is the most uh, say important part. And we said that this is the heavens, what uh, God have in his vision as a, we said, his vision board that is will help all of us to live together in the right way. And we said that it's also related to um, the seven commandments, the Noahide will, uh, what the seven commandments are going. So before we will go back to the seven commandments that is related in the Genesis, let's speak in a bit more depth to the 10 commandments of the, um, that Israel got in Mount Sinai. And I want to remind us all also that this last Friday we spoke, we celebrated the acceptance of those 10 commandments. And uh, so I'm going to share the screen and we're going to go to dive inside. Just a moment, let's see where it is. I think it's here. Yes, hopefully. Hey, I managed. <clears throat> okay, chapter 20 is a, it's a bit uh, surprising because it is not, it's not speaking only about the Ten Commandments. There's something else at, at the end of this uh, chapter mm -hmm. and it is related, it's all related. But let's go step by step. Okay, we go step by step about those Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are starting, I will say, the first command is a statement. It's a statement. It's like, uh, let's say, for example, 
um, like when you're going to a doctor, right, when someone, God forbid, in his illness, uh, have an illness, and he's going to a doctor, and uh, he's searching for the right doctor to speak with, and uh, he's looking for a specialist, for someone who's very special. So the first thing that the doctor is saying, um, my name is this and this, and I'm a specialist in this and this field. On the same level, also, we say um, the first command. So Dan, please read the first two verses. First two verses. <clears throat> God spoke all these words to respond. I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Okay, this is the first command. The first command is God is expressing who he is. Now, we need to understand. I want to uh, read uh, just a moment. Sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, <clears throat> please read this one, this uh, Rashi. Okay, Rashi it's, says, it's who, one. you don't need to listen, you don't need to read the what is in brackets because it's only the referral. So just read the main thing without the brackets, uh, without okay. the, you know, from Exodus, from this, from the Midrash, from Michilta, those words are um, disturbing people. Okay. Sure. Who took you out of the land of Egypt? The taking you out of Egypt is sufficient reason for you to be subservient to me. Alternatively, God mentions in Exodus, since he revealed himself on the sea as a valiant warrior, and here he revealed himself as an old man full of mercy, as it is said, and beneath his feet was like the form of a brick of sapphire from Exodus 24.10. That brick was before him at the time of the enslavement, to remember the Israelites suffering when they made bricks as slaves. And like the appearance of the heavens in Exodus 24.10, i.e. there was joy before him when they were redeemed. Since I changed in my appearances, do not say that they are two divine domains, but I am he who took you out of Egypt, and I am he who performed the miracles by the sea. That's it. Enough, 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 enough. This is enough. The main thing here is, it's amazing. Think about this. Um, the first sentence God is saying to us, to the Hebrew people, to the world. By the way, in those in these Ten Commandments, he spoke with everybody. He's saying to all of the people, we are not, I'm not, even though I have few appearance in, in one place, I'm, you know, like the master who is fighting the war in, in another place. I'm the person, or I'm the old person who is teaching the Torah. So maybe there are two gods. Maybe there are three gods. Maybe there are more than one. <laughs> no, you need to know I'm the same one. I'm the same one. And this is one of the first or the most important points of the Hebrew tradition that we don't have. We don't have um, few gods. We have only one. This is one of the most important points. Now, if we will think one step more profound, we see that he is appearing here, the two examples that he is bringing. One example is related to fights and to war against another nation. And the other one is speaking about the Torah, that God is giving the Torah. So we see that God, he have two, I will say, huts. He have two. Uh, main purposes, not only that we will be a nation that is learning the Torah and we will be spread out all over the globe in all sorts of places, but he is expecting us to become a nation and to have to know and to fight as a nation for ourselves. Those are the two main things that God is showing us as his performance. When we ask yourself, who exactly is the doctor that we are speaking with? Who exactly is the, um, this God that is guiding us? This God is guiding us for two main directions. And they are the same, from the same God, and they are the same, I'll say, the same direction. Even though they are two, like, it looks like two different things. 
One is that we need the national side, and the other one is that we need the spiritual side. Those two things, as he says here, since I change my appearances, do not say that there are two divine domains. Okay, it's not like that. I am the one who took you out from Egypt, and this is the national side, and I am me who preferred the miracles by the sea, that's still the national side, and I'm also the one who is, as we say in the before, who is revealed, revealed himself as an old man, full of mercy, okay? Like the most very old man, full of mercy, teaching the Torah. I'm the same God, it's not two. And the first command is something I will say a bit different, a bit aside. It's not part of the main 10 commands. It's more like the identity of God. The identity of God is without um, being divine to a few uh, parts. We don't have three gods, we don't have two, we have only one. And the second part is that it's the same God who is dealing with the nationality from one side and with the mercy and the Torah and the, the blessing of the Torah on the other side, and it's the same God. Okay, till now, it's very simple. Now we're going to be a bit more complicated. Okay, you all ready? ready? Everybody, everybody is ready now? We're going to be much more complicated because as we said, we have three men. I'm going to explain this step by step. So if I'm not clear enough, please stop me. Um, we're going, um, now that we put, we lay down one of the most fun, fundamental issues and we're saying that God is one. So also, also the relationship that we spoke about, man with himself, man with his fellow man and man with God are supposed to be something very completed that have relationships also inside themselves. And I need to explain this a bit. And we will go and we will show this in details because what we have left are nine um, commandments. Okay, the first one here, we said it's only, or it's mainly to show who is God. So we have stayed, we stayed with nine commandments. And nine is the number of three times three. We could do it as a brick, you know, it's three in each side and each one of them is very close. So we have three, three and three and each row of three commandments one of them is dealing between men and god the other one is dealing between men and his and himself or his fellow and men and his fellow men and the last one is dealing between men and himself but each one of them have also strings and connection that are relating to let's say take for example men and god but there's also other two that is men and god and men with his fellow men, men and God, and man with his, with himself. And the same thing with the second row. Okay, so I'm going to explain this uh, slowly and carefully. So we will see it step by step. Okay, the first three um, laws, okay, number two, three, and four, are dealing with between the question between men and God. Yes, Travis, you wanted to ask something. I can't hear you, so just open and unmute yourself, okay? I was just pointing up to God because two, three, and four were between us and him. And that's all okay. I was doing. Very was good, saying. exactly. Okay, exactly. You're right, the first three are between men and God. Let's see, for example, what are the first uh, three? Um, the first one is, uh, Dan, you can read please verse number three. Verse number three, you shall not have the gods of others in my presence. Okay, so it's very simple. It's between men and God, right? Let's go on. Uh, and it continues also verse number four and five and, uh, and six are also related. Let me close Rashi for a moment because we don't need it now. We need it very much, but not now. <laughs> okay, so let's read verses number three, four and five and six. Okay, this is the next All point. Right. You shall not have the, uh, the gods of others in my presence. You shall not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness which is in the heavens above, which is on the earth below, or which is in the water beneath the earth. You shall, not, shall neither prostrate yourself before them nor worship them, 
For I, the Lord your God, am a zealous God, who visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the sons and upon the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. And I perform loving kindness to thousands of generations, to those who love me and to those who keep my commandments. So the first one is very simple. You shall not have uh, any other gods, any pre presence of other gods. And this is clearly, this is very simple. It's related between men and his God, and men and God. But this is men and God from all sides of it. Okay, it's men and God and men and God, God and men, that's it, nothing else. Let's go for an uh, example to the second stage and the second one or the, the number number three, okay? Number three is in verse number seven only. Verse number seven, please read verse number seven. Verse number seven, and you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain for the Lord will not hold blameless anyone who takes his name in vain. And here we're speaking now about something very interesting. Because first of all, it's if you are, I will say, if you're honoring one God, this God, that the Almighty who created this world. So it's not um, honorable to take his name and to have some sort of a, a how do you say, to swear a, in his name, okay? Um, so you need to honor his name. But when you're speaking about uh, doing this, uh, you say it's written down here. Um, you should not take that. Uh, the word vain. Uh, vain is for nothing, okay? It's for doing for, for nonsense. But uh, the main issue here is, and this is what's written down in Hebrew, in Hebrew is that uh, you're not going to do any um, any swear, any any uh, promise with the name of God if you're not uh, if you don't want to do that. <coughs> this is related. Bless you all. This is related to men and God, but also men with Himself. It's not related to uh. anything else. This is already something that is related also, where man is dealing with Himself. When he's dealing with himself, he's swearing. It's not, it's not related to anyone else. I'm promising to myself, maybe even to my friend, but it's mainly with myself, with, within inside myself. So he was dealing with a, um, with a command that is related between men and God, but also have some sort of a, a sign between men and himself. Let's go to the next one. And the next one is, is a Shabbat, it's a Saturday, okay? So let's read for a moment between verses 8 and verse 11, please. Remember the Sabbath day to sanctify it. Six days may you work and perform all your labor, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord, your, your God. You shall perform no labor, neither you, your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, your beast, nor your stranger who is in your cities. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and sanctified it. So we see here, and we spoke about this uh, seventh day also when we learned the Genesis a year ago, but what we see here, it's very clear. From one side, it's related between man and God. He created the world for six days, and the seventh he rested. But on the other side, there is here some sort of a twist or another angle. And the angle is in verse number 10. It's also that not only you are going to rest, but also um, your son, your grandson, um, your uh, everybody, your daughter, your main servant, everybody is going to rest. So it's also have the twist, not only between men and God, but also between men and his fellow men. So the first three are dealing between men and God from one side. On the other side, there's also a twist not only between man and God, but also between man and himself, man and God and himself, and also between man and God and his fellow men. But the main three are dealing between man and God. But because we have one God and he have the completeness of everything here, so there's also some sort of a connection between those um, 
commandments that between men and God, but also have the point of view that are related to man and his fellow men and man and himself. Let's go to the next three in the row, okay? The next three are dealing mainly uh, between men and his fellow men, okay? Men and fellow men. And we're speaking about uh, three, main three. And the three are, first of all, in chapter, in uh, verse number 12. Let's read verse number 12 and let's explain that for a moment. It says, honor your father and your mother in order that your days be lengthened on the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Now, who exactly, uh, I will say, um, who exactly brought you to this world? Not only God who gave you the soul, but also your parents. So this is related between men and his fellow men, men and his parents, from one side. On the other side, it is a bit reminding us, or it is related to men and God, like God, who is above us and gave us soul. Also, our parents are something that are above us and gave us the body parts, and we are related to them. So this is between men and his fellow men, his father and mother, and it's also related, it's also have a twist, it also have some side of between men and God. Now, the next one, you shall not murder. And I think that this week it's really very, uh, it's, it's very interesting to speak about this uh, thing. You should not murder. But you should not murder, it's connected to between men and himself. And, uh, men, sorry, men and his fellow men. And his fellow men and, his, and him himself, you know. It's not related to anything else. This is the hard call between men and, him and his fellow men. Not to murder the other one else. To understand that you have, if we have, each one of us, have a soul, and I have spark of God inside me. He gave me also, like we spoke a minute ago, my father and my mother gave my body, but he gave my soul. But also my friend next to me have a soul. And the other one have a soul. So if I can't relate to him, so go away. But don't do anything to him. Because if you're touching him, if you're doing something to him, you're doing maybe something also to God. But this is the heart call of between men and his fellow men. Now, the next one, the next one is not only you should not murder, but you should not commit a adultery. I'm not co- covered. Adul- Just a moment. Yes. Not give adultery. Um, not adultery. I, I'm not sure that it's a, the right word here. Uh, Abba. Abba to show me out. Just a moment. Let me see, check this up. Uh, what do you, explain to me the word in English. Adultery. It's not uh, related to other gods. Mm-hmm. It's a... Uh, it, it, isn't that related to between uh, uh, man and man? And it's also uh, a jealous God when we're talking about showing our uh, affection toward inappropriate, inappropriate. Uh, okay, excellent, excellent. Okay, excellent. You ex- exactly, exactly, Travis. It speaks about when people, um, for example, okay, um, a couple who are married, and one of them, never mind if it's a, uh, if it's a boy or the girl, are going and doing some sort of a, a inappropriate a relationship with someone else who is married. So this is between men and his fellow men from one side. On the other side, it's also between men and himself because what you're doing here, it's a very deep um, corruption in the loyalty that I have to the area around me. So, it's, but the loyalty here, it's not only the outside loyalty, what I'm doing to others, it's also inside me. So this is, again, it's connected between men and himself, uh, sorry, men and his fellow, uh, fellow men, but it's also related, it's also have a twist, it's also have a point of view between men and himself. Okay, so those are the three of those. Now let's go to the last three. The last three are, you should not steal, and you should not uh, bear false witness against your uh, neighbor. And the last one for me is verse number 14. 
Number 14, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. Okay, so no, all of those uh, three, all, those, all, the, all of those three are related between men and himself. Okay? And it's very, um, it's very interesting to note. The first one is to, you know, you should not steal. Now, these... There are two ways how to steal. One of them is to be a fit, and the other one is to stand in front of, to confront the person that you want to steal from him and to steal from him. But here it's written down in the Hebrew, you should not be a fit. Now, what is the problem with a fit person? He is not afraid from God. He is afraid because he's doing things at night, but he knows that God looks at him. He is afraid more about the people around him, that they won't see him, okay? So it's, so it's basically some sort of a problem, one with himself, he's stealing, he's taking from others, and, uh, but it's also a bit of a twist between man and God, because he is not afraid of God, he's afraid only from people around. And then you have the next one, where it says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, and we are speaking, we're saying basically that uh, you have a problem between uh, it's related with yourself because you're doing some sort um, of a false witness. It's something inside. You're deciding to do something wrong inside yourself. You're deciding to do lie inside yourself. But it's also related a bit between men and his fellow men because you're doing it against your neighbor. And the last one, is inside yourself to inside yourself only. What is speaking here? It's only that you're not allowed to have any, not covet your neighbor's house, not covet your neighbor's wife. Nobody can see that. Nobody can understand that. Nobody can see it only that. It's between yourself and yourself only. It's something, it's something inside yourself that you have some sort of a wish or a will to to use or to do, to, to behave um, not properly inside yourself. So we went here in those nine commandments, okay, after the first one that is expressing who is God and it's, it's almighty that is one, even though you have a few preferences and a few ways to expose himself. Then we're speaking about those three connections, I will say, man and God, man and his fellow man, and man and himself. And we're giving for each one of them three commandments, while each commandment is also related a bit to the others because God is one and everything here is supposed to be very knitted inside, like, uh, like uh, uh, one, uh, one full organism who have connections from every side to each side. Those are the 10 commandments. Now we can understand a bit deeper what is happening um, in the next uh, part of this uh, chapter. In the next, first of all, if anybody have any questions, this is the time. If not, we'll continue on. I think that they usually I'm knocking people down. People are still, you know, thinking about what I'm saying. Everything here is, you know, very clear. This is what I've learned from my rabbis. Nothing here is. I'm, I'm betting anything. By the way, this is um, this is a way of uh, learning this uh, those ten commandments that is already written down for more than a thousand years. Okay, so all feel comfortable. We've learned here something very, very long roots, um, understanding. No questions. Okay, let's continue. <laughs> now we can start to understand a bit more what is happening here. Because you can think, mistakenly, that uh, we don't need to have any connection to the Temple Mount. That's it. We have Ten Commandments. It's very clear. It starts, you can go from each side. It starts from God and going from the connection with God to the connection with your fellow man and then within yourself. You can go from the other way around also. You can start from verse number 14. You need to behave properly inside yourself and to continue on, you know, one step after one step after one step until you have the connection with God. It's very nice. Maybe we don't need the, the, the Temple Mount. Why do we need the Temple Mount? Look how much trouble the Temple Mount is giving us today when we are not still in the Temple Mount, and the Arabs are so afraid that we're going to build it, we are going to do this soon or late. <laughs> but uh, and how much uh, debate we have in the last 2,000 years about this Temple Mount. 
between a, 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 a how do you call it a hot lion king what is it was his name um richard lion king okay and the, the richard Arab the lion. lion yeah yeah so, so much debates are going why why do we need the type of mouth we have 10 commandments so let's see what's happening here in the next verse in the next verses first of all we see that the people of israel were very um torches and they and they were they saw the torches of the shop and everything else and they hung out the smoking and then they were very uh trembled that's what you say right and they stood very far and they said to moses please read verse number 16. 16 and they said to moses you speak with with us and we will hear but let god not speak with us lest we die okay they're very terrified first of all the most important thing here that it's not only one person who said i spoke with god therefore you need to listen to me all of the nation all of the hebrew nation kids women adults everybody everybody spoke with god they were terrified they spoke with god it's a very hard situation to speak with god the almighty who gave us life and to be judged in front of him to stand in front of him is to be judged with him are we um, do we have the permission from him or are we behaving right enough so he will let us to live more this is what they're saying we might die we don't know if we are doing if we are fulfilling our uh, mission in life god is giving us life he wants us to fulfill our mission and suddenly we're standing in front of him he's asking us are you doing what you need to do so usually people are saying to themselves uh i prefer that the someone else the prophet will speak with god not me it's even hard today to stand in front of a judge mm. a normal judge you know who's going to the toilet like all of us <laughs> a normal judge is going to the toilets but when you're standing in front of judge you're very terrified so think about this to stand in front of god all of the hebrew nation all the people they saw the voices they saw the torches they saw the shofar everything the sound of the shofar everything and so this is a very important thing and uh, at the end they, they managing okay the people remained uh, far off but moses drew near to the acute uh, darkness and they went to in front of god and here we have find a very very important uh, verse please read verse number 19 Verse 19, the Lord said to Moses, so shall you say to the children of Israel, you have seen that from the heavens I have spoken with you. Okay, we all saw that. And it's not the same. Oh, I need to show here, Rashi, for a moment. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, we're back. In a moment, we're going to the seven uh, commandments also. This is very important, Rashi, here. Um, Okay, um, the Lord said to Moses, you should, you, so should you say to the children of Israel, you, you have seen that from heaven I have spoken with you. Okay, you have seen, please read this, uh, Rashi. You have seen, there is a difference between what a person sees and what others tell him. Concerning what others tell him, sometimes his heart is divided whether to believe it or not. Okay. I think that he is referring here, Rashi, to the difference between the Hebrew nation and other religions, I don't want to mention, a religion who others told us that God spoke with them. Right. And here we all saw that. It's a very big difference. But here we're going on to another very interesting thing. And here we have another um, three um, commandments, very important commandments. But now let's see for a moment with our division, man and God, man and his fellow men and men with himself. Let's see those three commandments, how they're referring and from where they're coming. So please read verse number 20. You shall not make images of anything that is with me, gods of silver or gods of gold, you shall not make for yourselves. This is speaking between men and, men and, and God, right? Men and God. Don't do any other gods, not from silver, not from gold, not from anything else. 
אוקיי? אוקיי, let's continue on. And now we continue on and we say that we need to do the temple. Please read the temple in verse number 21. 21, an altar of earth you shall make for me and you shall slaughter beside it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your cattle. Wherever I allow my name to be mentioned, I will come to you and bless you. Build for me some sort of a temple where you have an altar, not from a, as we said before, not from silver, not from gold, not from anything else. From the earth you will do it. And there you're going to do um, all the sacrificing for me, and I will bless you. Okay, I will bless you. And now let's see the three very interesting um, things. Okay, the first one, number 22. 22, and when you make for me an altar of stones, you shall not build them of hewn stones, lest you wield your sword upon it and desecrate it. Yes. Why do we not allow uh, to have to have the uh, to build it from uh, straight uh, stones? Because we um, wield our sword upon it, right? This is related for the problem that not to kill anyone else. The sword. Don't bring the sword inside to the temple. Number one, men and his fellow men. Let's continue so on. It was all natural stone. Exactly, natural stone. Let's read the next command, 23. 23, and you shall not ascend with steps upon my altar so that your nakedness shall not be exposed upon it. We, we need to have... Yeah. It's without any um, steps, but it's all, you know, some sort of a road, but it's climbing up. And why is that? Because we won't see, uh, we won't, we don't, we're not allowed to expose our nakedness. This is what we're not allowed to expose. This is related between man and himself. The part of the body that is related to himself, inside. Again, inside the temple. Let's read the last one. Oh, sorry, I, almost, I lost one. Just a moment. Um, no, this, the first one was this. You shall not make with me gods of silver and gods of gold. This is the first one. This is between men and God. The second one is that you're not allowed to bring anything that is related to the sword upon the temple. This is between men and his fellow men because the sword is killing people. And the third one is between men and himself. Don't be in a situation where you show your uh, nakedness uh, in front of God. So we see that the temple is very important and the three main issues that are related, man and God, man and his fellow man, and man and himself are also being um, nailed or starting in the temple. Okay, those three um, uh, commandments. Now we can go back to the seven commandments of the Noahide. Who remember the seven commandments of the Noahide? And you will be amazed to see that they are also the being related on the same things, on the same realms. Okay. Um, let me find that. I, I think I have um, a PowerPoint of that. Just a moment. Let me find it. That's what uh, I found. Was. Just a moment, just a moment, just a moment. This one. No, no. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, didn't, I, I have it, but I have it. let me find it for a moment. It's not to curse God or no blasphemy. And, and what do you? Yes. What do you see in in? Uh, do you see my? Uh, you see my screen or not? Yeah, we have both. We have both, Rabbi. Yeah. Oh, just a moment. Just a moment. Eyes. Uh, that's good. <laughs> Do you see the covenant of peace now? No, sir. Okay, so we're going to, so I'm going to show it to you. 
just a moment, stop sharing, let's do the share again. Um, now you see the covenant of peace, right? Yes. yes. Excellent. Okay, so we're going to do this very fast because we all know yeah. the seven, uh, seven commandments, but I want to show that the seven commandments are also related. It started not in the Hebrew nation, it started even before that. So let's uh, go on where God is saying to Noah and his son, and I behold, I am setting up my covenant with you and with your seed after you. So we all relate to this covenant. Yes. And uh, let's continue on. So the first one, sorry. The first one is the knowledge of God. It's related between man and God, okay? Um, the second one is blessing God. It's related between man and God. I will continue on running, oh, okay? Preservation of human life. How much we need to hold? Not to murder anybody, not to do bloodshed. Um, we saw things about this. Um, the family, those are the regarding illicit relations. Uh, and it's also related, love between men and women uh, as one of the highest expression of both human and divine morality. We spoke about those things. Maybe I need to show this presentation um, uh, more often, okay? The uh, uh, possessions, you know, laws of, uh, again, robbery and the animals. Now, after that, after all of those six, we have the uh, judicial system, but this is uh, connected mainly to the um, nation, to the humanity, not to one person, okay? The first six are relating to each person. The last one is relating to all of the people. And now what we said, that we have um, three relationships, okay? It's already started with the other many. We have the human and God, human and himself, and human and friends. So let's see for a moment what we have here exactly. The first one is the knowledge of God is related between human and God, okay? The preservation of human life is between men and his fellow men, not to do bloodshed. And the family is related between man and himself. But let's continue on. Okay, the next part is the laws of blessing God. It's the same thing. It's related to the relationship between man and God. And the laws against robbery is related between man and his fellow man, not to steal from him, not to take from him. And the eating a little live animals is related between man and himself. We explained this more than once. The, um, the thing today, we are so far from the nature, so we're not, uh, and we don't understand this uh, command in the right uh, way. The issue of this command is that we are not supposed to, if I'm hungry, I'm taking the, uh, um, the animal, I'm starting to eat it even though he's still alive. I need to control myself. And this is the beginning of all of um, morality in our life. All the morality that we have in our life is where we can stop our animal behavior and start to use or start to behave with a bit of more passion, with a bit of more, um, uh, we have more time with ourselves to control all the animal sides of us. And this is the eating of, uh, from a live animal, not to eat from everything that is uh, as it is uh, without anything. So we see that also the seven commandments are also being on the same, I will say, platform, man and God, man and his fellow men, friends, and man and himself. The seventh commandment is basically saying how to build up all this structure of the, that we will keep this, those seven laws, and this is the judicial system that we need to build up. So it will hold that we are doing all of those things without missing anything, that nobody will go aside and do bad things. This is mainly the covenant of uh, Noahide, of the Noahide. So the covenant of Noahide. And then after that, with much more detail, the covenant of the Ten Commandments are being structured in a very simple uh, system, I will say, that is re uh, dealing with all the relationship that everyone has within himself. Okay? Man with himself, man with his fellow man, and man with God. And when we understand that, everything is very clear. And this is also one of the reasons why 
Moses gave the, the Torah, what is the most important part of the Torah? The most important part of the Torah is, I will say it like that. You can go to India area, the India, China, um, Japan. There are very, um, there are a lot of um, things there that is related to the spiritual side between men, maybe with himself or men with God. You will go to the Roman world and you will find that the judicial uh, system is very uh, structured and everything between men and his fellow men is being structured. Never mind if it's, it's the best thing or, or wrong, but there are a lot of, I will say, places or things that you can do between men and his fellow men. And uh, also between men and himself, also there are a lot of uh, spiritual uh, understanding how to behave. But the only uh, I will say Torah, the only system that is being, uh, I will say, in a completeness way, in the right measurement between all of the relationships, this is a Torah that is giving us the right, I will say, eyes for each side of those relationships. And this is why the Torah is so completed, because it's not only being given from God who created this world, but he gave us the right measurement and the right adjustment, adjustment between all those um, parts that we have inside ourselves. So we will do it in the right way. So even though it's written down the Ten Commandments in the Genesis book, in the sorry, in the um, no, the second book, in the Exodus book, Exodus book, we see the foundation in the seven laws of Noah in Genesis book. And it starts already with Noah for all of the humanity. And it's being much more detailed in the part when it's being given to the Hebrew nation. That's it, this is what I have to say to them. Till here, if people have any questions, something. <laughs> I hope it was clear enough, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, Rabbi, I wanted to ask if you could back it up a little bit uh, when you were uh, reading about what was going on between uh, Hashem and the tabernacle, the, 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 the temple, if you will, but how it started out with a tabernacle where Hashem was saying something in what you were reading um, about when he would move, his name would move. Um, they followed, from what I understand, the presence of Hashem in the wilderness. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Because I seen in that verse the way... Uh, uh, that was reading was that um, his name would move. And um, it said, yeah, I, I'm under the impression. What was the trigger is what I'm asking uh, that caused them to move the tabernacle from one spot to the next? Uh, no, I, I missed you. I think I missed you for a moment. I, I don't understand exactly what you want me to speak about. In, in, in the desert. In the uh, desert, okay. after we're moving, Moses. We're moving, to, we're moving to a different uh, subject. Yes, it's a different issue. Okay. Sort of, yes, yeah, sort of. Okay. But when you okay. are reading the Ten Commandments, when you're reading the Ten Commandments, and then you started to talk about the transition to the, when you said the temple the, 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 the service. The source of those, of those three relationships are standing also already inside the, um, the Temple Mount, the Tabernacle, as you said. Okay. Right. Like we read. So you right, and it described... It described about about the um, you know not to have the stones to step on and it should be done out of, not out of hewn stone with the with the sword, um, but it said something in one of the verses in there that it's so good. It's so good. Okay. during the tabernacle during the time of the tabernacle before the temple was established long before the temple was established during the time of Moses and Aaron and. Joshua, basically, what exactly ignited the motion between when it was time to fold up the tabernacle and move? You know, and I believe it said it there in that verse that his name, wherever his name would rest. Uh, and so I'm trying to ascertain what precisely were the Hebrew people following in the wilderness and when did they pack up the, the tabernacle and then reset it up? I mean, Hashem's doing some great teaching there, and I'm hoping that you can explain to the audience what exactly they were following. We know that it described 
who Hashem was and the way he appeared as an old man, you know, with grace in, in you know, at the giving of uh, Sinai, the giving of the, 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 the Torah. But when the tabernacle got established, um, when the tabernacle got established, what was it that triggered the, the shutdown of the tabernacle to move from here to over there? You know how the temple was in Jerusalem on the mountain and it was in a specific spot set up specifically. And we all know this. I, I'm just trying to see if you can elaborate. No, no, no. I, I can I understand what you're saying now. Okay. Um, I understand what you're saying, but I'm finding, first of all, it's very interesting because we're going to read this, um, this, uh, uh, this uh, coming Shabbat, we're going to read it in the, uh, we're going to read it in the, in the, in the synagogues. Two, okay, in the synagogues. Yes, I'm looking, I'm trying to find the exact uh, uh, verses. Just a moment. Um, in, in the desert, I will answer. First of all, I want to answer. Okay. Okay. Here we have the, the verses that are explaining what's happened there in the desert. In the desert, they were usually um, working or doing through the what God told them to do with the signs. Uh, please read verses number 15, 16, and 17. Uh, verse 15. On the day the Mishkan was erected, the cloud covered the Mishkan, which was a tent for the testimony. And at evening, there was over the Mishkan like an appearance of fire, which remained until morning. So it was always. The cloud covered it, and there was an appearance of fire at night. And according to the cloud's departure from over the tent and afterwards, the children of Israel would travel and in the place where the cloud settled, there the children of Israel would encamp. Now it's continuing on. Um, please read verses 18, 19, and 20. 18 says, At the bidding of the Lord, the children of Israel traveled. And at the bidding of the Lord, they encamped. As long as the cloud hovered above the Mishkan, they, they encamped. When the cloud lingered over the Mishkan for many days, the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not travel. Sometimes the cloud remained for several days above the Mishkan at the Lord's bidding. They traveled, and at the Lord's bidding, they encamped. Okay, it's continuing on. Another three verses like that, and it's concluding with the verse number 23. Sometimes the, the cloud remained from evening until morning, and when the cloud departed in the morning, they traveled, or the cloud remained for a day and a night, and when the cloud departed, they traveled. Whether it was for two days, a month, or a year that the cloud lingered to hover over the Mishkan, the children of Israel would encamp and not travel, and when it departed, they traveled. At the Lord's bidding, they would encamp, and at the Lord's bidding, they would travel. They kept the charge of the Lord by the word of the Lord through Moses. What we're saying here, it's more, okay, you can see that it's, you know, saying this again and again and again. And the meaning of this, uh, the profound meaning of this, is that the Hebrew nation is going on the Lord's, on the God's words, okay? He yeah. is guiding us. Where At his bidding. Guide? Exactly. Yeah. He's guiding us what yeah. to do. Now, in the desert, we have a very simple sign, very clear sign, but it's a long history. It's like that also. It's speaking here also about the full history of the Hebrew nation, mm -hmm. where they're going through the bidding of God, um, in the words of God. And, and in the desert, it was only, you know, some sort of a training. What will happen when they will be in the desert of the nations and the exile of the nations? This is the same thing. They are still worshiping God and they're still going through the ways of God and through his um, guidance until the end of days when the Hebrew nation is coming back to the homeland. Okay, it's some sort of a, this is mainly the, the situation. here. Amazing, like, Rabbi. Like, <laughs> so every day they would be out. eating, they would be eating the manna, which was between them and themselves, eating the manna. I mean, it's, it, it, and relating with the entire camp i guess so you've got all three of these kind of going on like you say a point of training pretty amazing so, stuff uh it's true it's true but this is a i think this is what you asked 
how exactly they went, how exactly they stopped. They are going through the guidance of the of God. So in the in the desert, at his bidding, yes. Exactly, you can see you can see the fire at night, and you can see the cloud in the, the day. When you finishing the desert, okay, you went to the Israel to the Israel land, and then you go into the exile. So the fire is more of the, the cloud is the words of the Torah that is guiding us, okay, along the history. And this is how we are going from one place to another place until the end of the days. Beautiful stuff, Rabbi, beautiful stuff. Stephen, hi, good to see you. It's amazing that you are awake. It's amazing that you are awake at this time of day. Okay, good to see you also. Um, okay, question. Do you have any yes. questions? I have yes. a question, Rabbi. Yes, Anna, okay. yes. Uh, it's regarding uh, about honor your mother and your father because it's yeah. very explicit in the Ten Commandments that we that the Israelite people should honor their mother and father. And uh, in some way, I can understand because when God give uh, the Ten Commandments, it means automatic that the parents are righteous. But with the Noahites, it's not explicit in the Noahites that we have to honor our father and our mother. But it's in a common so a common sense law. Uh, uh, but my question is. If your uh, parents are doing despicable things, do we still have to honor them? You honor them. First of all, uh, you want to say something, Angelica, about this? Oh, <laughs> oh it's okay. Um, my thought on that was you honor your father and your mother because they gave birth to you. And whether they go one way that you do not, um, it, that is not appropriate. Um, with the seven Noahide laws, you still honor them. It doesn't mean that you have to uh, agree with them. It doesn't mean that. Honoring is, is, um, is something different than when you have to agree, oh, well, you know, they're going this route and it's not the right route. It's not a good route. They're doing stuff that is not appropriate. Doesn't mean that you don't, um, you know, uh, yeah. This is very nice, Angelica. I think very Doesn't nice. Thank you that. very much. No, no, no. You still honor. Yeah, 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 honor. Exactly. I think that you said the main point. I think from one side, we need to honor them because they gave us birth. They gave, uh, brought us to this uh, world. They gave us the opportunity also to be in the world to come. Yes. Without of them, we wouldn't have got all of those uh, opportunities. Yeah. Uh, to honor them is one thing. Do we um, uh, participate with them in their own, wrong way? No, no, we don't need to. And we have a lot of questions from time to time. We're getting questions. We're getting questions all the time. Okay, from all over the world, and people are asking us, especially in India. Okay, where yeah. people are doing a lot of idolatry, and we have a lot of people in India who became no height, and they're asking us if my parents, my elders. Uh, they are very old, and they're asking us to take them to the place where they're doing idolatry. Am I allowed to take them, or I need to do something else that someone else will take them? Yeah. And the truth is that if you can manage that someone else will take them, it's better. But if you don't have any any other solution, you can take them to this place, okay? And uh, and say to yourself that you're just honoring them in their way. And but you're not you, you're not accepting it. So yeah. to do differentiation between from one side uh, to honor them and the other on the other side, not to agree with the wrong way that they are going. This is something that uh, we need to do this differentiation inside. Yeah. I must say that also in the Hebrew nation we find it from time to time because we have today in our world a lot of secular world, and we have also people who are. Uh, returning back to God through repentance. And then they have also in the Hebrew nation people that from one side, they are maintaining and they are holding and they are doing all the things of the Torah. And the other side, the parents are not doing that. And then we have those conflicts on the same level. It's, it's similar. And they, we are trying very much to teach, okay, those who are doing this uh, repentance, though this movement, how to do this differentiation from one side to honor the parents, on the other side, uh, uh, not to, 
to honor them and not to agree with them. To do this in the right, in a very honorable way. Good question. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, uh, Rabbi, if I could ask yes. a question. Yes. Um, um, the, the first commandment given to Adam and Eve was to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Uh, where is that? Where is that in the seven or the ten? The question, the, the main question is if it was a commandment or a blessing. Uh, if you uh, understand that it was a blessing, okay. it wasn't a commandment, it was a blessing. You are going to be not only multiply, but also fruitful. It's, it's two right. different blessings. So God is saying, you are going to be like that. I'm going to, I'm blessing you that you will be multiplied and fruitful. It wasn't a command. Right. Uh, Rabbi, and you've shared before how being fruitful is totally different than just multiplying. <laughs> it's true. It's yeah. true. Multiplying is more and more, 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 uh, more of the same. <laughs> okay. Fruitful, it's already something new. If you're looking at this as a blessing, so we don't have any questions. Okay. Yes, Travis. Yeah, I'd like to say something about honoring father and mother. Yeah, uh, go on. Yes. Uh, it's a common sense thing. They gave you birth. Uh, we are not the Israelite nation. Uh, they commanded it to the Israelite nation. The Israelite nation was never to sacrifice their children. The nations were sacrificing children. Parents were giving their children over to be passed over the fire. So, God left it, in my opinion, he left it open. If your parents are loving, say there's three partners, and if you honor the human father and mother, you're honoring our spiritual father, right? So you're showing honor there, but he chose which womb to put you in. He chose which womb to put you in, whether you're Israelite or, or Noahite. And, and it's on the actions you, you still have to, by honoring them is being a productive member of society, not being a blight on the community. It shows honor to the parents. And that's what I believe it's more about is that we can show honor to our parents through honoring the father, the creator. First of all, you're saying good things, uh, but I must mention two uh, very important points. I must uh, mention them here, even though they are a bit, um, they're a bit different in the, from the point of view that you mentioned, okay? You allow me, it's okay. <laughs> um, point number one is that when you're going to the Gemara, Gemara the Gemara, okay, the, the oral laws of the Hebrew nation, you know that we get two um, Bibles. We got the written Bible and also the oral Bible. Right. When you go to the Babylon Talmud, you will find that when the sages are trying to show, to express, to teach us how to um, behave right to our parents, they're taking examples from non-Jewish people. Because um, the Babylon Talmud, our sages, they understood that uh, behaving correctly Honoring your parents is not something that is related only to the Hebrew nation. Maybe the Hebrew nation got it as a commandment, but it's something very um, moral, basic moral that everybody needs to do. Yeah, we uh, learn from I, everybody. I, I know, I know, I know that it's a bit hard if you believe, not you specifically, okay, I'm speaking about everybody. If the world believe that the um, men come, men, came from the monkey. So yeah. each generation is trying to look only for the next generation, not for the, because every, every uh, generation above us is more related to the monkeys. Okay, in the Hebrew nation, we know that every generation above us is related to the Sinai mountain and that they saw God. So we're looking for the other generation. This is where we have the, but again, it's very moral uh, situation. And this is how the Hebrew sages understood it's a very moral situation to respect your parents. By the way, by the way, this is also something that is teaching us how to relate to God. Because my parents gave me life. And also God is giving, giving me life. And when I know how to um, respect my parents, I'm also training myself how to respect God. Mm -hmm. Something to think about. This is also why 
we're doing this differentiation. And the second point I want to mention uh, that is a bit different than what you said. We believe in the Hebrew nation that our soul, each one and one of us, had a discussion with God. Yes. In what, a great discussion with God. In what nation to be born and to which family to be in. And the understanding of this, the deep, profound understanding of this uh, belief is that each one of us chose, chose for himself his mission in life. Okay? If to be a, a, a Hebrew man or to be a Gentile, not a, in the bad understanding of Gentile, so it's not Hebrew man, okay? And if he's, a, if he's a, not a Hebrew man, but he's a Noahite, so he has the influence to have more influence around his area instead of trying to become a Hebrew man, okay? Because he chose it. Where? He chose it not here. He chose it when he was a soul. When God called him and said, look, so this is your time. This is your opportunity to do something here in this world. And he asked us, you want to be male or female? You want to be um, a Hebrew man or you want to be a not Hebrew man? You want to be in each family? In which family you want to be? Go look in the families around there and choose up your family. And now I decided those things. Therefore, I have responsibility to fulfill my mission in the right way. And I can't blame anything else except for taking more responsibility. So those are the two points I must mention, okay? Um, it's a bit related to things that we spoke uh, last week and I didn't want to go inside too much to this uh, this week. Uh, in the beginning, I wanted to, first to, to learn. Uh, it's very important for me that we will learn. Those measure, uh, sessions are mainly, for, first of all, for learning and then discussing all sorts of things. Um, the Tanya is a very important book. The Tanya of the Rabbi, you know, of the Rabbi Shneur Zalman Milad, okay? But there is also a very a parallel book. Now, I said it more than once. I think that Dan heard it from me more than once. We have in the Hebrew library, we have, this is good, all of you, we have more than 80,000 books, okay? More than 80,000 books in the oral tradition that we have. Okay, my library here that you see, it's less than a thousand. So, and this is one part, so I have another thousand in the other side, that's it. It's not a lot. On the hard disk today, we have, we have 80,000 books. Now, I'm saying it must be clear, it must be loud. Nobody will say that they didn't say it. One of the important books are the Tanya. If I will mention um, the most, uh, I will say uh, 20 books, most important books after the Talmud, the 20, so, you know what, I'm not sure that they, it will be in part of the 20. It will be part of the 50 most important books, okay, after the Talmud. Uh, there is another parallel book, by the way, the Nefesh HaChaim book, wrote also a very important book with the Tanya. Um, if, but if you will go for the most important five books, the Tanya is not inside. Okay, so I'm not saying not to learn the Tanya or not to know the Tanya, but the Tanya is only part of the puzzle, okay, of the books. And this, we need to know that. Now, I know that the Chabad people, it's very important for them to teach the Tanya. It's very important. I'm not saying that it's, it's not a good book, but it's not the most important than the first book. And some of the things that you said are also related to things that are being learned from the Tanya and not usually also there's also some versions how to learn the Tanya. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not again, I'm not saying, by the way, if you will look, you will see there's a, a yellow um, in the shelf there. There's a very a spark yellow thing. This is the explanation of the Tanya. Okay. Just a moment, I'll bring it. I'm highlighting it for the viewers on uh, online. Yeah. <laughs> I run my cursor over it and they can see it. <laughs> they can see it. There's, a, there's seven books that you can see. The Ura Tanya, you see the Tanya here? So it's not not to learn those books. It is important to learn those books, but you need also to know, I will say the relationship of those books among themselves, exactly where we're putting them and who are converting them, who are saying things a bit, I will say in a different uh, twist, different angle, and uh, then it's bringing things to much more harmony and peace. And when we're sticking only to one side, 
of the library of the Hebrew nation, we're losing it. Okay, this is a very important point that we spoke from last week. Another important point that I must mention, um, and it's very important because I see uh, Dennis De Niro here. Dennis, uh, can you hear us, Dennis? Oh, um, can you see us? Um, I saw that Dennis, uh, Dennis, 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 can you see I'm here. Can you say, Ah, good to see you. I saw a very nice video that you put uh, online uh, yesterday, on Saturday. Yes? Total, total Rabbi, I appreciate that. Yes. But there's something that I must mention, so I will mention it here in, in front of all of us, okay? If it's okay, okay. with you. Um, I'm sorry that I'm also putting things online, okay? I'm sorry that I'm not, uh, I'm trying to be as nice as I can, but from the other side, there are things that I need to to say where it's a bit uh, um, missing the lines, I'll say it like that. In my eyes, where the things that I've learned from my rabbis and what we are teaching, and we are trying very much, I think that we also said that, uh, we are very connected to the tradition of the rabbis of Israel, the chief rabbis of Israel, these uh, chief rabbis, the, uh, the people, the chief rabbis before them, the chief rabbis before them, and also with the government, and we are very unknown as the mainstream I will say, of, the, of the Hebrew tradition. Um, two points that are very important to say. First of all, I'm not, a, a, you said, you mentioned yesterday that a people, you mentioned the story, it's a true story, okay, it happened. The, true, the story that people came to the airport of Israel, it was related to me also, because he did um, the pledge a week earlier before that, he did it with me. Um, the, the, the person that uh, this story is about him. He came to the airport of Israel and they asked him, what are you doing here? And he said that he came here to learn a bit of the Torah and they've heard of the third that he is going to preach some uh, uh, Christian things in, this, uh, in Israel. So they, did, they said to him, go back to, to Lithuania. <laughs> and uh, he said to them, and then he took out the the pledge and he showed them that he is an Ohite and they, they called us and we said that we know him and they let him go inside to Israel. But first of all, it's very important to say, I'm not offering anyone to come to Israel without uh, having a visa to Israel, okay? If you need to have a visa to Israel, organize a visa before. If you want to organize a visa before, they won't speak with you. They, it won't help that you will take out your certificate. It won't help. I'm telling you, it won't help. If you have a visa and they will try to do problems with a visa, we have um, all sorts of ways to help, okay? For one example, I will say something that we didn't manage. For example, and Jacob, Jacob, knows that, that in India, we are fighting for the last two years uh, with the immigration in Israel, that they will give a permission for something like a 20 people that we know, know, we know for a long time to come to Israel and the immigration of Israel are not giving us permission. And it's very frustrating. We're working very hard with this. You know that, Yaakov, Yaakov, you know that. It's not a secret. We're working very hard about this. And we didn't manage it. So I'm asking for someone to come with a visa. The second thing I must mention also, on those days, because we don't have yet the Sanhedrin and we don't really have the Sanhedrin and we don't have um, the most of the Hebrew nations still are not here in Israel. So we don't have yet the full part of a Ger Toshav. Okay? So it's true, it's true that as a Noachite, you move down one step and you are, I will say, when we will have the Sanhedrin and when we will have a, a, most of the Hebrew people in Israel, it's also that you will become a Ger Toshav and you will be able to say, I want to settle in Israel. And then you will need to have to pass the authorities of Israel that they will give you the permission to live in Israel. And then we also have more obligation to those who are Noahide. But this is for the world to come, not the world to come for you know, another, another 50 time. years or I don't know what to say, you know, after we will die, then the world to come. The world to come also another, hopefully another two, three, five, seven years. But it's not yet here, here alive today. And we need to know that also. So you said very nice things yesterday and I really appreciated um, your words, but we need to be very careful because there are people today, especially in the United States, who think 
that uh, think that they are going to do the pledge, and that's it, they can come to Israel, and everything will be okay. I'm telling you the truth, it won't happen. So we need to be careful. Um, okay, so those are things that I must say, I wanted to mention. Questions, questions, people want to say any more things, people want to ask more things. Well, I do have a question now based on what you just said on the yes. story. Um, you just said Christian idolatry, and so could you clarify on that a little bit? Because to me, how you can't be a Noahide, you can't be, you know, a Noah if if you still believe in that nonsense. So <laughs> what is the deal here? How does this guy even have a certificate? No, 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 no. no. He's, first of all, this guy doesn't believe in Christian at all. The authorities, when he came, they thought that this, this is what he's going to do. They said to him, but you're Christian. You're going to teach us Christian idolatry here. So he said, no, I'm an Ohio. So they said to him, what? Um, we don't understand you. So he took out the certificate and then they called us and everything else. All of the things happened. And they were amazed. They said to themselves, but how come someone from Lithuania is coming and he is not a Christian person? Okay, this is what happened. Here. But uh, it's true. Um, but I will say you something that uh, we personally, okay, the, the group of the North Red Wall Center prefer to do, but I must say that there's also some sort of a debate in the in the English, uh, in the in the rabbinic, rabbinical uh, also debates inside, okay? Yeah. Um, if someone believes in the God of Israel and the interpretation of Moses and also believes in Jesus, okay, that he will uh, save him from, I don't know what, because we don't need it. Um, <laughs> there are some rabbis, there are some rabbis who accepting them also as an Ohio. And there are roots for that. I'm not going to uh, go inside. So we need to know, I'm saying, uh, we not holding this uh, position and we are saying that leave alone all, you know, all Christianity, idolatry. And yeah. Jesus was I think was a very clever man. He, he, he wasn't even a prophet. He was a very clever man. He brought a lot of good things to the world, also a lot of hard things to the world, okay? All of the fights and everything else. But he wasn't, he's not a God. He died. He went to the toilets like all of us and everything else. This is what we are saying. Uh, but there are, there are, I'm saying, there are rabbis. Um, who are very hard line ones, yes. Who are accepting yeah. those people as a Noahite. And I won't say that they are very far from the halacha. So again, the halacha also, we are more strict than that. And we believe that everybody will live at the end of the day. So, so uh, um, Jesus, but uh, again, this is, part of, this is part of the things that we believe. We believe that there is still, uh, because we don't have the Sanhedrin, I think we said it a few weeks ago. The first uh, halachic debate in the Hebrew sages started only 1300, sorry, just a moment, 1500 after the Hebrew nation started with Moses. Until uh, in the beginning of the 1500s, we had a structure how we are deciding between the debates and how the halachic uh, way is only one halachic way. After 1500 years, when we lost the prophecy and we also lost something else, then we started all the debates inside and we have, we have also few roots, not only one. And we need to know that. And there are things that are inside the boundaries, and there are things that are outside, okay? Uh, we need to know that also. Okay? There are things that are related to not, not a lacha at all. And we're going with the mainstream. There is also next to us things that are still inside the boundaries. It's okay. We think that they are a bit, I will say, uh, not in the mainstream. And this is also why we got the certificates. We got also the, the acknowledgement from the chief rabbis all over the way because we are in the mainstream of the lachic side. But they are also not outside from the halachic, also some ideas, but again, they are not the mainstream. And uh, this is it, yes. 
Uh, Rabbi, I just want to, you know, help with the English uh, to clarify, especially for uh, Dennis is, is a learned person who's come out of, uh, uh, you know, being uh, involved in Christian leadership. The the clarity here, Dennis, is and, not about... And, and, and we appreciate very, very much this step and everything that you did. Okay. Yes. Right. The difference he's, uh, Rabbi's clarifying is that there are some rabbis that, that, would think that just believing is okay, but worshiping is definitively out of bounds, right? So, so worshiping would be over the edge and is considered idolatry. It's the question of just having a notion or a belief that he was like the earliest uh, Ebionites were were uh, like a patriotic term referring to a Jewish Christian movement. Um, they they believed that he that, that he might have been the Messiah at that time but they didn't hold the virgin birth and divinity at all, right? So so the rabbis that, that, that Rabbi Goldberg's talking about that are on maybe on that side, well, if a person just believes or thinks that he was, you know, a, a decent person that people held to is far different than worship. You cross the line definitively when you worship a man as God. And I think that we, we brought this out tonight, especially with the, the, the uh, Ten Commandments, especially in the first and second, uh, commandments that you know the have no gods before him not in his presence i believe that the way it was read not even in his presence so you're at you're at a boundary so when it's in in your your belief structure that you have a thought you have a thought you think that this might be the way see we, especially here in the west we're all brought up a certain way so we're brought up under this understanding we don't know any better in a lot of regards and and to draw closer to god to get to know uh, more, we're, we're, we're reaching out, we're throwing out feelers, we're trying to learn, we're reading texts, we're reading this. And until we come to those that are able to teach us and share, which is what I find great about what the prophet said about 10 people grabbing the hem of a, of a, a, a Jewish person's garment and saying, let us go with you, you know, for we hear that the, the Lord is with you. We need to know, we need to understand, we need to clear, clarify. And so the debate of belief you know, with some rabbis, there are many, many, many rabbis that believe if you believe, if you worship, you're out of bounds, period, end of story. But what Rabbi Goldberg's saying is there are a few that think, okay, you believe it, that's fine. But if you're worshiping, you're out of bounds. And so I find Rabbi Goldberg to be one of the most compassionate, kind, uh, soft-spoken, and yet his English isn't the best, but I understand him. And I am so thankful that you take the time to share these lessons. <laughs> Well, English, <laughs> English isn't the best. This is uh, something you need to complain to my parents, not to me. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, I mean no. I mean no slight no, or no, dishonor. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. I, I uh, refused to speak in English when I was young, so it's my uh, it's my problem. I was a Hebrew man, you know. I was uh, in Israel and I wanted to speak only Hebrew. Honorable. So now I'm paying the. I'm giving the payment for that, but it's okay. I still have a. A good enough English to speak with all of you, so it's okay. And uh, thank God. Yes, yeah, Scotty, you wanted to ask something. You wanted to mention something. I, I, I do want to ask a question, but I also realize that we're running out of time for you. Do we have, uh, do we have one more time? So tonight? Tonight is very interesting. I have till uh, twenty another another twelve minutes. I have. It's okay. Girl Hashem, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to wheel this back into today's text. Can I do that? Just wheel this back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got two computers up here going, so I'm going to try to, in today's reading in Exodus 20, verse 16, at the end of that verse, uh, of course, they're talking to uh, uh, Moshe, Moses, uh, you, you speak with us and we will hear, but let God not speak with us lest we die. Now, my mind flipped over when we read that, when you read that, uh, to Genesis, where uh, Hashem was telling him, in the day you eat of it, we're talking about the tree of the uh, knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. Is there a correlation there between that, those two? One is they're, they're not afraid to die, so they ate it. Now, suddenly, they're afraid. Is there any, uh, the only dumb, I've, I was told the only dumb question is a question not answer, asked. So is there a no, position? No, 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 no. First of all, first of all, feel comfortable everybody to ask questions. It's okay. Um, there's no dumb question. There are questions. Thank you. Thank you. Questions. Everything is okay. Uh, 
Uh, it's a very nice question, by the way, because uh, um, there isn't, if, if the Bible is using the same words, so there, must, there must be some sort of correlation between those uh, episodes. Um, even though, first of all, we need to understand the differences between those two episodes, okay? Um, because I said it more than once, the first three chapters in the Genesis are not speaking about what's happening in this world. They're speaking what's happening in heaven. Okay, when someone grandpa is dying, God forbid it. So we say to the young kids, um, grandpa is in heaven. So well, the body is here, but he's in heaven. So the first three chapters are speaking about something that happened in heaven. It's a bit um, more parallel, more stories that is trying to explain to us the main roots of things. Uh, and here we're speaking about things that's happening in our world. Okay, the Hebrew nation was alive. The Hebrew nation was here. They saw God speaking with them. They saw the, the fire. They saw the clouds. They saw everything. They heard God and they were terrified. Why they were terrified? And this is something that we need to understand. Um, when you're getting close to the source of life, you want to be part of source of life. Of the source of life. Um, I will show this as an, in a, an example of the electricity. Okay, the electricity is something that the uh, the source of the electricity. Okay, the place where they are manufacturing the electricity. It's so powerful place. So if people are going getting closer, they're starting to feel on their body the vibra vibration and other things. And when they're getting too much closer, they're becoming electricity by themselves, okay? Let's go to the same understanding. When the Israel people met God, okay? And the normal understanding is when you're meeting the source of life, you want to be connected to the source of life. Even though the meaning of this is to lose the small life that we have here. And this is what happened to them. They said to Moses, we are going to get inside to God. <laughs> We're going to withdraw ourselves inside, you know, to get vanished inside God. Stop this here. You can speak with him, you know. And Moses went for 40 days to the mountain, didn't eat, didn't drink, didn't do anything. So he died there for 40 days. Let's try to not to eat and not to drink for 40 days, okay? And he got to die there, you know, he got out of God. And then he came back, new life. And the Hebrew people said to him, and if you will go to, for example, what is the Vipassana that we know in the Indian world? The Vipassana is trying to go out from this world because we have life, but the life here are very small if you compare them to the real life when you are related to God outside of your body. And this is what the Hebrew people said to them. If you won't stop it now, we are going to go inside to God and to die from this world, to go straight ahead to be connected with God. But God wants us here, so we must stop it, okay? The Adam and Eve, it was a different story, as we said. So first of all, we have a differentiation. Then we can find the ways how to show some sort of relations between those two. First we need to know that, exactly. Okay, yes, Timothy. Uh, so Rabbi, I just want to share, uh, I became Noahide last week, so I'm very yeah. happy about that. Yeah. I wanted to tell everybody that. And also I thank you for like authentic uh, Torah teaching. And I, you bring a lot of insights I find and it really helps me. Thank you thank very you. much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, more questions. If someone else has, if not, it's okay. We can, you know, after an hour and a half. Well, I'd like to continue on with what we were uh, discussing just a minute ago. Okay. And I was talking to uh, Rabbi uh, Sherbo, and the one thing that I shared, and I'll share in this Zoom meeting, is that uh, this path has been possibly the most difficult undertaking of my life. Um, and I mean that in a, in a positive way. Because when you're coming out of where, like myself and a lot of others have, um, we basically, our foundation was based on lies. 
And so we adjusted everything in our life based on this false reality. And then coming out of that and trying to straighten out all the, the mess in our heads on how things are. So what, what I said to Rabbi was that this road is about as mucky and as muddy as it can get. And you're just kind of wading through trying to find the truth. And obviously the truth is in Torah. But when you have reform rabbis who don't even believe that Hashem is the creator, okay, when they're denying that, that's rabbi con man, as far as I'm concerned. So when you got somebody like me that's just out there and you're just looking to rabbi after rabbi and you don't understand that there's an there's orthodox, um, which is basically that's an oxymoron because you're either observant or you're not observant. Well, then you start looking into the Noahide. That's why I'm so thrilled with what you guys are doing with the Noahide World Center. Totally Dennis, can, Dennis, can I just ask, what do you what do you qualify as a rabbi? That's a really good question. Because a lot of these rabbis, when I said rabbi con men, there's a lot of people that call themselves a rabbi, and I don't consider them a rabbi because they they don't they don't follow Torah. So how could they possibly be considered a rabbi just because you start printing out business cards? Just, just a moment, just a moment. It's, a good, it's, a, it's such a good question. Travis, do you have an answer for that? Well, when, when I look to a rabbi, I look to see, are, are they spiritual? Do they believe in Hashem? Do they speak to? I actually went into a, a reform synagogue when I first started the search for truth. Oh, uh, when we got into it, they started talking about uh, self-actualizing uh, that we ourself are in control and we are God. I said, whoa, I said, I just stood up and stopped the service. I said, wait a minute. I got a question. Uh, what about Hashem? What about, and they started to talk to me as they done that. I just picked my stuff up, folded it up real nice and said, this is not the place for me. And I moved on because I'm looking for spirituality in truth, because that's the only way for my soul to reach the spirituality of the father. And so that's, that was me and how I picked the rabbis and I went and, uh, and, and you will be directed. You will find somebody that will point you in the right direction to the right rabbi. And you will know that connection. Just like when you met your parent, your wife, you will know that connection. There will be a physical, uh, a spiritual connection. You will know that is the rabbi. And that's me. That's what I think about it. And that's how I found my rabbi. Okay, okay. First of all, first of all, it's a very good one. And especially the issue of the connection, it's very true. Um, I'm, I'm sorry a bit that Netzach uh, left us. Netzach is a, a Czech uh, person, Czech Republic person. person. I um, did not leave you. Ah, oh, okay. Video. Netzach, please. Video. Uh, good to see you, good to see you. Um, and first of all, Travis, you said an excellent answer also. Thank you very much. I know that, that you have uh, answers, but please, for a moment, uh, let me run the show. Okay, done. Um, Netzach, can you say um, what is a rabbi for you? Who is a rabbi that you're saying that he is a rabbi? And I'm permitting you, permitting you to say everything that you want to say here. To, to be very honest with you, for me, a rabbi that I trust is mostly a rabbi who no longer lives. Whom, um, because the rabbis who already died and are accepted by the Jewish community as the true uh, mainstays of the oral Torah, they, they no longer can do uh, anything that will disqualify them. In other words, for me, like what they, what they write and say, uh, is proven by by history and a whole people of Israel accepted that and uh, but at the same time I feel the the need to be connected with the because the Torah says that uh, whenever we have some halachic question we need to go to the authorities that will be within the people of Israel in those days uh, in those days and so currently I'm I'm mostly uh, consulting things with you with uh, Rabbi Goldberg, sometimes also with uh, with uh, another uh, Noahite uh, organization that there is. And uh, 
but I, I, I had a personal experience with uh, a rabbi that turned out uh, false. So for me, this issue is not, it's, it's really a trust issue as well. And um, it's, it's not easy to be, to be honest with you. <laughs> First of all, you're more than right. But I will say something. I want to say, please, with your permission, I want to share with all of you something that Netzach did to me in the beginning of our relationship. Okay? Netzach asked, who was, first of all, I think that what Netzach said is very important. He says, um, judge, the history judges exactly who are the main rabbis of the Hebrew tradition and who are outside. And it's true. The truth is, it's true. It's already written down in a very long time ago in the Deron Ban, in, in, in other places that they other very big rabbis of us. But Netzach also did to me something very, very interesting. He asked me, who are the rabbis of Rabbi Shelki? And who are the rabbis of mine? He was the only one from, from a lot of people, okay, who asked very directly, I want to know who are your rabbis and who are the rabbis Shelki's rabbis? Remember that? And I gave him a very detailed answer, right? With all of the links. So you can check up exactly who are my rabbis, who are my Shirky rabbis. And I think that this is the second stage, okay? The first stage is very important. We need to know the rabbis that were in the mainstream of the Hebrew community along history. And part of them is also the uh, rabbis of Chabad, okay? With the Tanya, part of them are the uh, Hasidim, Yisnagdim, all of those things. But we have a list of rabbis, a list of chains, chains, a chain that went from one rabbi to another. This is very important to know. But on the other side, the oral Torah, the Torah that is running around them among the Hebrew nation is being held with rabbis that are alive today, that are connected to rabbis that were along the history. So as you all said here, it's very simple to organize a card, okay? My name is Rabbi this and Rabbi that. It's much, much harder to have, and this is the first thing that we're doing in, in the, for example, in the Brit Shalom book, in the, also in the prayer book, it's much harder to have acknowledgement from the chief rabbis of Israel, from the chief rabbi of Jerusalem, people that we are learning from till today, and we are connected and this is where you're starting to see um, what we call the main chain and the esoteric chains. People that are very nice people. As you said, Travis, they're doing the services for themselves. They're doing things for themselves. It's very nice. But they are not from the main chain, okay? Um, uh, or the main chain of the Hebrew tradition. And this is why I was so pleased. When Netzach asked me, who are your rabbis? I, I, didn't, I didn't hesitate. I sat down for more than half an hour. I looked exactly for all of the sources of my rabbis, Rabbi Sheki rabbis, and I sent him a very detailed um, information because I think that this is the main question. And this is the main question. When you're finding someone and you think that you have the spark with him, great, not a problem at all. Now ask him, who are your rabbis? From where you learn, who, with what chain you're connected to the Hebrew nation? Believe me, this is a very, very interesting uh, checkpoint that will bring you to the, I will say, to the main call of if it's a false or a true rabbi. Okay. Now, if you want, I let's uh, I can spread over what I think it sent it. I can give it also to all of you. It's not a problem. Maybe I need to put it on the sites. Maybe we need to put it on the sites. I think that some of it are on the sites, but it's not a problem. We can put it on the sites. And this is also why we're giving all the time the acknowledgement, okay? Now, I will give an example. Um, uh, and the truth is, I'm not going to speak about others. Like always, I'm not going to speak. You can find for yourself. You can ask for yourself. A lot of things that are running around, and to ask exactly who, from, to what chain this is connected. And then you can understand where it's standing. But it's, it's a very fundamental question. Okay, that is something that we need to think about. Yeah. That's right, Rabbi. The chain, the chain is the big thing, and it goes all the way back to Moses. And you know, Moses uh, shared it with Joshua, Joshua to the elders, and the elders to the prophets, and the prophets to the members of the great assembly, and so on, and so on, and so on. So the chain is the 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 unbroken chain that goes all the way back to Sinai, 
is the key of the whole matter. And um, anybody who just professes a title, that's something totally different. Uh, being connected to the chain is the key. And, you know, as a B'nai Noach, all I can say is it's such a joy and an honor to hear the true Torah come uh, out of Jerusalem, out of Israel, that is connected with that chain. It's very important to say also that Moses was connected to the chain also above him, not only from God, also above him, okay? Because his father, who saw Levi, mm-hmm. who saw Jacob, and Jacob saw Shem, sons of, son of Noah. He saw also Abraham and Isaac, but also they, all three of them saw Shem, the son of, of Noah. And Noah and Shem saw Metushelach, and both of them, Metushelach, saw Chanoch, and, and also they saw Shet. Shet, what you call, and he saw Adam. So we're speaking about the chain that is coming from the first, from Adam and Eve, and till Moses, and from Moses till today. And this is the question that we need to ask ourselves with this uh, thing about who is a real rabbi? With whom are you connected? As a rabbi, with whom are you connected today? Not to say all sorts of things. With whom are you connected? And this is a, a main key of what's happening here in the uh, in this thing also of the Nolachite. Um, we had a very, very long session today. It was my honor to have this. I got one session. more thing I want to say. Ah, okay, no problem. I'm still not done. Sorry? I said, I'm, I'm still not, not done. It's not okay. I have, I have another Rabbi? Question. Yes, yes, I can have a few more minutes. Yes. All right. May, 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 it's not, you know, me, it's nothing, but look about uh, Stefan. Stefan, it's already four o'clock in the morning almost. Yes. <laughs> Todorava. Um, my thing is, is that it's been so difficult because there is so much misinformation out there. And what we need is we need to pave the road because the road is not paved. It is not simple. It is not easy. And it's very easy to get off on these tangents or these, um, as I said, the rabbi con man, there's, there's too many of them. And what I think needs to happen is we need to set the rules exactly what it is, but what it's going to boil down to is we need a council of Gerim. We need to have the Noahide Sanhedrin put together and to literally establish exactly what it is, is acceptable and is not acceptable because this is the final. And uh, I believe that this is uh, a very critical stage for the coming of the Moshiach and that this needs to this needs to happen. Um, Dennis, yeah, this has been tried. I mean, go back over over 12 years ago, there was a, uh, a Noahide Sanhedrin started, and there was difficulties and dilemmas, and I've had chats with many people in the United States that wanted to set up something. Uh, you know, what needs to happen is is B'nai Noach need to, to mature. B'nai Noach need to, to grow into being the leaders they need to and connecting these threads first um, because – if, if I got to be public about it, I mean, the difficulties that happened when they first tried a Noahide Sanhedrin is the rabbis got greatly involved and it became a, a rabbi run thing. And it was not actually a Noahide Sanhedrin. It was rabbis, right? Real rabbis in the chain, in the link. And it comes down to questions and connections and truthfully understanding how we need to be impacting our little local communities rather than truthfully having just the global scale. I mean, you know, long story yeah. short, but I'd love to have some chats with you if you have the time. No, no, you said good things, Anna. It was already we tried. I think that we need to find, before we're doing a Sanhedrin, we need to organize a, some sort of a committee. Okay, the Sanhedrin is two stages up. Let's start with committees. Mm-hmm. A, com- a committee of the Noahide, where people are also... The first stage is that every one of us is supposed to feel like Abraham and to spread the words around. And the second stage is to have a committee of leaders. And then we will manage to have, when we will have committees of leaders, uh, more and more committees of leaders in the United States, or in, United States in America, in, other, in the Canada, and in Europe, and in India, and in other places in the world, then we will manage to build from those committees um, a Sanhedrin. 
No, but this is second, it's a third stage. The first stage is that we need to know, or we need to, to spread the word around, okay? And to start to um, work like Abraham to say those words. Now, it's not easy because a lot of people, when they're moving to the Noahide understanding, so people are going away from them, close friends moving from them. We know those uh, things. Everybody is passing those things, okay? Um, but still, there is the truth, and people are at the end of the, of the days, people are connecting to the truth. And uh, when we have, again, I'm saying communities, we will manage to build up a committee of the head of those communities. And then the next stage will be to learn also in, you know, in Israel for a moment of time, or so, uh, uh, some sort of a time, and to become also synergy. By the way, one of the things that we wanted to do, and we're still thinking of doing it, not this coming November, but the next coming November, another year and a half, to have a very big uh, assembly in Israel for a lot of Noahide from all over the world. Now, the corona has stopped us from speaking about this, but it's something that we're going to do. Uh, by the way, we're starting, um, hopefully this week we will also publish it. We're going to start also um, an Israel tour for a, a live tour on the Zoom, okay? Um, we get connected with the people who have um, who are tour guides and they're doing a tools on the video like that, like we're doing here. And it's a, we're going to publish this and to, to invite people to have the tools, you know, an hour two in Israel through the computer. But it's a, it's the beginning, okay? We want to, people will get related also to Israel. And this is also part of the thing of the chain. The chain is the Hebrew nation in Israel. It's not the Hebrew nation. It's the Hebrew nation in Israel, this is part of the chain. Um, so hopefully we'll have, we'll do all those things. Um, Dennis, with your permission, I, I think I, I need to go now. <laughs> We had a very long uh, uh, discussion this time, and hopefully we're going to meet next week. Uh, but we also learned, it's very important for me also each time that we're going to learn things, not only to discuss things. It's good to discuss things. I'm really, it's amazing every time to hear, to listen to all of the things that you're speaking about, to uh, adjust things and also to help or to assist with whatever we can help. Uh, and thank you very much for participating. We had it also right. as a broadcast on the on the YouTube, right? Yes, sir. We're still live. We still got a good crowd out there, Rabbi, and I really appreciate you hanging in here a little later. Usually, there's another class that needs the Zoom room afterwards. Yes, uh, tonight, I tonight, wasn't tonight, expecting. Tonight yeah, <laughs> I wasn't you? expecting to go this long. So, Rabbi, are we tentatively on for next week? Yeah, yeah, of course. Why not? Yeah. All right. So, folks, you heard it right from uh, uh, Rabbi Heim Goldberg in Jerusalem. Till next week. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.